is uh, Emily Heaton. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Agronomy at Iowa State University, and I work on biomass crops. A biomass crop, um, to me, is a dedicated crop used for energy or non-food purposes. So the crop standing behind me is a good example. This is Miscanthus. Um, its full name is Miscanthus giganteus, but we'll just call it Miscanthus for now. And this crop would be grown for a variety of purposes. It could be grown for cellulosic ethanol. It could be grown to burn with coal to produce heat and power. It could also be grown for animal bedding, which could then later be burned for heat and power, say in a, a chicken house. Um, it could also be used for bioproducts, um, making medium density fiberboard or um, things that you might make bamboo out of can be done with, with this crop as well. So there's a variety of reasons to grow these crops, but importantly, you don't eat them. So what kind of soils and climates do you need for growing a crop like Miscanthus? Um, fortunately, Miscanthus is quite forgiving. It's a warm season grass, so that means that it does like warmer environments, but it happens to be quite well adapted for cool, temperate climates. This particular grass, Miscanthus giganteus, is actually the most productive perennial plant known at cool temperatures. It, uh, it can produce more biomass in a year than, uh, than other comparable perennial crops. So that's why we are particularly interested in it for, for biomass. You just get more bang for your buck, more, more yield per acre. You can pretty much grow it anyway. Uh, it grows best on highly productive land, what doesn't? But you can grow it on marginal land as well. And it could be marginal for a variety of reasons. Maybe uh, it's poorly drained. Um, maybe the soils are just a little bit thin. Maybe they're alkaline. Miscanthus is fairly tolerant of a wide range of environmental conditions. What this grass in particular is not tolerant of is, um, is drought. We like to joke that you know, if you want to get high yield from Miscanthus, just add water. It won't die in uh, dry years. In fact, this is the productivity you're seeing behind me is in uh, 2012. We have one of the driest years on record in Iowa. We're currently about 17 inches behind on our rainfall for the year. And we still had um, yields ranging in the, the nine ton an acre range. So when I say it's not drought tolerant, that's a, that's a relative term. I would like to see yields that are higher than that. And we usually get higher yields if we have more rainfall. So the soil is fairly tolerant, climate best in the upper Midwest <clears throat> or in cool temperate climates, and uh, weather fairly forgiving, but you do need adequate rainfall in most areas. So where would I imagine um, planting some miscanthus? I imagine planting miscanthus not necessarily in huge dedicated tracks, certainly could, you could put it on CRP land, it would do fine in large tracks. But I think where it becomes really interesting is to think about strategically integrating perennial grasses or perennial plants like these into our agronomic setting today. So imagine your field. Everybody's got an area of their field that doesn't do as well, right? Maybe you have more erosion in that area. Maybe it never drains in that area. There's something wrong with one part of your field. Maybe you have to go through a tiny gate to get to a certain part of your field and you really wish you just never had to plant that part. This is the crop for those areas. By putting a deep rooted grass like this one into marginal areas of existing cropland, what it does is essentially helps clean up the rest of your field. So maybe you have soil moving down your field a little bit more than you'd like, put this canthus in there. It'll catch that soil. And as it catches that soil, it'll also catch nutrients that, that might be leaving your field. So you can almost think of it as a living terrace or a living buffer, um, but strategically incorporating Plants like Miscanthus can help clean up your, your current system, keep your streams a little bit cleaner, help improve your soil organic matter, um, without really taking a lot of land out of production because you're already using you know, less productive areas of your field anyway. So again, you can use it anywhere, but strategically deploying it in the agricultural setting as it is today might be, uh, might be particularly advantageous for a given farmer. What we would normally do with miscanthus is plant it after um, ideally Roundup Ready beans. So something that has cleaned the field out uh, and made a nice light residue that'll be easy to plant into. You can certainly plant into heavier residues, 
but I don't recommend planting directly into um, sod or into uh, uh, corn residue that hasn't been somehow uh, modified. Well, there's a few ways to plant miscanthus. It's sterile, so this, this plant does not make seed. That's a good thing and a bad thing, right? It's a good thing because this is a big grass that doesn't really need the hand of man to prosper. It can grow without a lot of water, it can grow without a lot of nutrients. Uh, so what's to keep it from becoming a weed? Well, the fact that it doesn't really uh, propagate that easily. It doesn't make seed, and the rhizomes on this particular type of miscanthus spread slowly. So a rhizome is just an underground stem. It's uh, a storage organ that these plants use. Maybe you've seen lilies. Lilies do the same thing. So you have to dig up lilies and plant another piece. That's what we do here. You dig up one piece and you plant it someplace else. Uh, you can do that or you can plant what's called a plug. And that's where you order an, a small little plant that's propagated the same way uh, from a greenhouse. So they send you a box of little plug plants and you put them through a transplanter, kind of like tobacco. Um, and you, you just transplant a field like that. There's some new technologies coming on that are sort of a hybrid between those two mechanisms that might be a little bit more forgiving. But for right now, planting is by far the biggest hurdle uh, with miscanthus production. It's, it's really just a pain. It's not that cost effective yet. Um, but the joy is that once you plant it, you only have to do it once, right? It's sort of like the crock pot of plants. You set it and forget it. Well, during that establishment year, the plant will go from a little rhizome or a little plug to one that has maybe mm, five to 10 shoots. And you'll see it spread out a decent amount. So I like to plant these uh, every 30 inches. So 30 inches between rows and 30 inches within the row. And the plant starts to fill in that space. In the second year, you'll get maybe 25, 30, 50, 60 shoots, depending on how uh, fertile the soil is. And it pretty much stays that way for the next 15 to 30 years. So every year you get a new crop of stems, you harvest those stems, next year a new crop of stems grows. It's, it's like magic. Um, why do I say 15 to 30 years? That seems like a big time span for uh, the life of a stand. Um, it's simply because we don't have a lot of long-term evidence to tell us how long a stand of this campus lasts. The oldest stands in Europe are more than 30 years old and they're still productive today as they were when they were planted. Um, there's other areas where we've seen some yield decline after maybe 10 or 12 years or even 8 to 10 years, but it's hard to tell if that's um, permanent or just uh, um, an effect of weather. Miscanthus will get anywhere from uh, 9 to 12 feet typically, and we would expect biomass yields on a dry matter basis ranging from 9 to 12 tons an acre um, on good land, maybe maybe seven to 10 on, on, less mar or on less productive land. But it's dry. So if you think about the amount of biomass that you have um, from say a silage crop, you have, you have as much biomass there and it's wet, right? So it's really dense. It's, um, it's kind of tricky to, to process. This is not dense. It's usually at about 10 to 20% moisture at harvest. And so it's fluffy. It's, um, it's bulk density is very low. And you really just need to have enough horsepower and drive slow enough that you can get all of the material to feed through your, uh, your equipment properly. So harvest is not, uh, not really a problem. You just need to be cognizant of the type of material you have, dry and fluffy and plentiful, and the type of equipment you have. What are the feeding mechanisms that you have on, on um, your, your mowers or your balers? And, uh, and is it appropriate for the type of material you're harvesting? And here, miscanthus is not unique. Um, it has the same pros and cons that most biomass crops, or even corn stover, has. So we have a plentiful material that is uh, not dense. So getting uh, the density of the material down uh, tight enough that you can actually load a truck to weight is uh, still something that we're working on in miscanthus. So a variety of densification techniques have been explored, and I think we need to keep exploring them until we find good ways to make this as cost effective to store and transport as possible. I mentioned earlier that the moisture content of miscanthus at harvest is really quite low. It could be direct cut, direct bale, uh, because the moisture content will all be, already be stable uh, in the 15% range at harvest. So storing is not usually a, a problem, just baled form or um, pelleted form, any standard method of, of storing the material should be fine. 
can be covered or uncovered. Covered is always better, but not necessarily as, as much as you might think. Uh, actually, miscanthus in its native range in, in Asia has historically been used as a roofing material, as thatch. So that gives you some idea of how um, weather resistant the material is. So it does, it does tend to do pretty, pretty well when stored at the side of the field, but it's always better on the cover. One of the reasons I like working with Miscanthus giganteus in particular is because in fertile areas like the Mid Midwest Corn Belt, it's nice to have flexibility to go back to other crops rapidly should you want to. You know, should the price of corn go to $10 or $12, right? You might want to pull every acre you can um, into production. So the way you kill Miscanthus is pretty simple. It's not Roundup ready. So what you want to do is uh, in the fall of the year, mow the crop off. Preferably while it's still green, when it's most uh, delicate, you mow it off and spray it with Roundup. Then you till it. Next year you plant Roundup Ready beans or a Roundup Ready crop on that field. You're done. It might have a few uh, volunteers coming up in the next year. Just monitor and apply herbicide as needed, but it's usually about a one year transition to, uh, to go back to another crop. Um, if you plant the sterile clone of Miscanthus, you shouldn't have any concern about it becoming a weed or moving outside of the area as you planted it. There are new types of Miscanthus being developed. Um, I think they have a lot of promise, but I'm not ready to recommend anything other than the sterile clone yet because we have these highly productive plants and we want them to stay uh, where we put them. A highly productive plant growing where we didn't want it is a weed. So let's keep this one uh, uh, as a useful tool in the toolbox and uh, uh, one that we can easily control. I like to joke that I consider myself to be like a, a soybean agronomist in Iowa in the 1930s. So there's not a lot of that crop, but it's about to get big. That's the way I feel about biomass crops. If we're not growing them on a very wide basis or have very developed markets for them right now, but there's a lot of reasons why we probably will in the future. And it's good to be aware of how this crop might work for your operation in the future. So what I usually like to tell farmers is be aware of miscanthus and crops like it. Understand how you might or might not use them on your farm, how you might integrate them to maybe achieve some of your stewardship goals or your conservation goals, even perhaps um, your bedding or your, your home heating needs. Um, and then you'll have that experience to draw upon later as the market develops. You know, if we really start planting this on millions of acres, you'll have that experience, you'll have that knowledge you've gained at sort of a small scale, a practice scale. Um, but then you can decide if you want to expand that in the future. You'll, you'll know whether or not this crop is right for you.